Welcome everyone to another session of the Friday Light Informal Research Talks. Uh, my name is Garrett Richards and I'm on the FLIRT committee along with Jennifer Buxton and Daniel Nadalny. Uh, if you are new to FLIRT and you haven't attended one before, basically the idea is to showcase research going on at Grenfell and other places and try to make that research accessible to folks in other disciplines and to the general public. So if you're interested in learning more or getting on a regular mailing list, you can uh, send an email to one of the three of us. You can post on the Facebook thread that's hosting this talk uh, or, or anything else. And please invite your friends. We're always happy to have more people on, on our mailing list. And our talks are also recorded. So you should be able to see previous talks uh, archived on the Grenfell Facebook page. We're also supported by the offices of research and engagement on Grenfell campus. So today I'm happy to welcome Darcy Wilson, who is going to be giving uh, an artist talk about some of her work. I'm blanking a little bit on the title. I didn't memorize it, <laughs> so I won't try to, to remember it. And I'll just turn things over uh, to you, Darcy. Uh, usually the way we do things is spend about half of the time on a presentation and about half on discussion, but really Great. it's up to you. So if you want to do something more interactive or take a little bit longer, all of that is fine. But I'll pass the floor to you now. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I, I think these presentations are so valuable. Like I love how it connects us all and it's so it's particularly valuable these days. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, the title of my presentation, oh my gosh, I don't even think I remember it. it no, I do. It is Lullabies for Stilled Life. And this is a reference to a, a project that I'll share with you today. Uh, and then before we begin, uh, I know we're we're probably gathered in different locations, and but of course I, I'm based in Cornerbrook, and I'm speaking to you from my studio. And as a um, a Grenfell campus project, I wanted to share the land acknowledgement for our school uh, to welcome you and to thank you for coming and sharing my presentation with me, uh, and to acknowledge that the land on which we would traditionally gather at Grenfell is in traditional Mi'kmaq territory and to acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothuk, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. So as, as yeah, presenting the Friday light informal research talk, the FLIRT series, my research takes the shape of art projects, artworks, exhibitions, performances, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist, but my work is, is all connected thematically. And as a, a descendant of colonial settlers in Canada, my work is really kind of, I'm looking at my culture's dysfunctional relationship with the natural world. The projects that I'll share with you today, I, I chose three projects to share today, and they're, they are linked because they all work with natural history museum collections in some way. Uh, there are so two kind of natural history museum collections and then one um, collection from the past that no longer exists, but it was a living museum collection. Before I begin that, actually, I do have another slide to share first. I, the first project takes place at the Banff Park Museum National Historic Site, and it's an earlier project of mine uh, completed actually completed 10 years ago now, which is bananas. Uh, time is flying, but this is still a project that continues to inform my work. So I wanted to start with this today. And this is where the reference of lullabies comes from the, the, the title. This museum was founded in the year 1905, and it was actually part of a series of early conservation efforts in Banff National Park. It's located in the Banff town site, and today it acts as a museum of a museum of sorts. It's sort of the original collection is still there, presented the way that it would have been over 100 years ago. As you look at this image of this diorama, it's um, a family of bighorn sheep. Um, there's a mountain goat in there. There, there are babies. It's, it's beautiful, but it's also, it's both repelling it's attractive and repulsive at the same time. It, it's beautiful to look at their bodies, um, to see how it's they've been preserved, and yet it's so sorrowful. I find looking at taxidermy is a really conflicting experience, and visiting natural history museums, often the wildlife galleries are very somber places that I find quite sad to walk through. 
On that note, as a sort of prologue from my presentation today, which will be about 30 minutes. I'm trying to keep it under 30 minutes because we have lots of time for conversation after. And I wanted to share an, uh, a quote, a citation from an, an essay that has really influenced my work over the years that I've, I've found um, really helpful when I'm trying to figure out how I feel about these colonial collections. It's an essay by Donna Haraway and it's called Teddy Bear Patriarchy. And in this essay, she talks about um, the American Museum of Natural History and the Great Hall of Africa in that museum, which was, it, it really is kind of a, a grand space. I don't know sure if anyone listening has had the chance to view it. I've visited there a couple times and it's filled with historic dioramas um, of, of animals that have been collected by the man who created the space, Carl Ackley, who is a big game hunter and a friend of Theodore Roosevelt. And um, so he traveled and collected these animals and brought them back to the United States and created these dioramas. And the dioramas are, you know, exquisitely beautiful in many ways, and yet so horribly sad. And it, it is a space that is, I find, very heavy and oppressive to be in. And yet it's filled with school children who are laughing and running and and it's filled with people who are kind of in a state of wonder looking at the animals up close. Haraway describes the space and the experience of looking at the, the taxidermy diorama in, in this way. Scene after scene draws the visitor into itself through the eyes of the animals in the tableau. Each diorama has at least one animal that catches the viewer's gaze and holds it in communion. The animal is vigilant, ready to sound an alarm at the intrusion of man, but ready also to hold forever the gaze of meeting, the moment of truth, the original encounter. The moment seems fragile, the animal's about to disappear, the communion about to break, the hall threatens to dissolve into the chaos of the age of man, but it does not. The gaze holds and the wary animal heals those who will look. There is no impediment to this vision, no mediation. The glass front of the diorama forbids the body's entry, but the gaze invites his visual penetration. The animal is frozen in a moment of supreme life and man is transfixed. No merely living organism could accomplish this act. And she goes on to say, this is a spiritual vision made possible only by their death and literal representation. What you're looking at right now is, uh, this is inside the Banff Park Museum National Historic Site. And it's sort of looking up towards the ceiling. I'm drawn by that description of, of looking at the, the Natural History Museum diorama and, and the fact, this idea of that, you know, the animal's body being sacrificed in order to be recreated to hold our gaze, uh, to make eye contact, uh, and that, that that eye contact has the power to heal. Uh, but it's also this skewed vision. The animal is dead. Uh, it's, it's been represented through this colonial and, and in this instance, and in the Great Hall of Africa, colonial and a male gaze. Um, so it's, it's a faulty vision. It's a little bit of an illusion. It's a little bit delusional even. And I'm, I'm drawn to this contradiction, this desire to have that kind of proximity to nature and to, or to the wild animal, but also, um, the destructive nature of that desire. So the museum that you see here, one could argue that this was created as a sort of gesture of care. Uh, and that may sound bizarre, but I'll explain what I mean. Uh, the museum was part of early conservation efforts in the park. It, it was designed to be a place of education, to foster an understanding of the landscape within Banff National Park for tourists and visitors and to kind of kindle within them a, a desire to protect the animals in the park. Uh, however, in order to do this, one of every species was collected. So it was killed and then stuffed and, and presented in the museum. And they're still standing there in these poses. I learned about this museum actually as a grad student. 
at the University of Calgary and in, in 2008. And then a few years after I finished that program, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I wanted to make another, I wanted to make a work about it. I wanted to respond to it and to kind of, you know, communicate my discomfort with this space. And I was fascinated by, you know, the intentions to, to educate and the intentions, you know, the good intentions to foster a connection to nature through this space, but also how failed this act it was in, in some ways and many maybe in every way. And I wondered if I, as maybe as a woman, but also as someone in you know the 21st century, could I enter into this space? Could I insert a different gesture of care? Could I nurture these animals in any way now, a hundred years later? And I decided I would write a series of lullabies for the animals. And so I wandered through, I visited Banff and I was doing an artist residency at the Banff Center at the time. And I created a video in which I, I wandered through, and these are video stills, in which I wandered through the space at dusk and I tried to sing the animals to sleep. I tried to find lullabies that would suit this collection and I, I really couldn't find any that work. There are a couple of sort of classic ones that I could tweak, uh, but I ended up writing and composing my own lullabies. And I, I created this work in which I, I'm singing to them in the space. I'm asking them to lie down and rest. But truly, my gesture of care is just as delusional. The animals, the animals are, are dead. They're not able to rest. They're not able to lie down. So this was presented as a video initially in 2011, but I continue to revisit this work. I've, I've presented this work as a live performance. This is at the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History in Halifax. And Halif that's where I grew up actually. So I grew up visiting these, these, this collection. I rewrote the lullabies for the specimens in, in this collection and these wildlife galleries. And during, it was during Nocturne, the Art at Night Festival in Halifax. I brought a group of people every 30 minutes, I, I re-performed the lullabies and leading a group of people through the space. So we wandered through the wildlife galleries and I sang to each diorama, to each collection grouping of animals. And then after this, the lullaby was complete, the lights were extinguished until as we moved through the space, it became darker and darker. And finally, the last lullaby was sung to the passenger pigeon. And after that lullaby, that light was extinguished. And we were all left standing in the dark among this lifeless taxidermy. And as soon as the lights went out, the illusion ended. The vision was sort of that connection between these recrafted bodies was sort of severed. And, but there's something kind of I mean, this is a really important piece for me as I was performing it. And I, every time that I finished and particularly finished here with this bird that has, that is extinct. It's so, so final. Um, I, I looked around the room and, and people were weeping. It was able, I think the music and, and being able to sort of activate the collection in this way, I was able to communicate how it made me feel as well. And I said good night, and I kind of snuck out through a side door. And then a couple security guards were helping me. There was an amazing team there actually helping me to realize this project. And they escorted the audience out with a flashlight and into the lobby. I've also revisited this work as a series of etchings. So these are copper plate etchings that are hand colors and hand colored and my lullabies for the collection at the Nova Scotia Museum are presented here. Here's just a, a couple examples of those. And then the final iteration of this project, although I hope to revisit in it in the future, is, is this piece, which was created for the Rooms Provincial Art Gallery. And this was part of an, a group exhibition curated by Mireille Egan uh, called In Some Far Place. So Mireille contacted me and invited me to participate in the show and asked if I could make a, you know, an, a, a response of some sort to this specific specimen, which is a flamingo that she had unearthed in the collection there. And she told me about the story of this bird, which had been flown off course with its mate and flew, was flying over. I can't remember if it was, was central or, um, but it was flying across the province, which is 
obviously unusual. And uh, a couple, a couple men were, you know, looked up and saw the the flamingos flying and thought, like, what the heck? And and they wanted to get a closer look. And so they actually they shot the bird down. So this bird was killed. Uh, it's unclear what happened to the bird's mate. And I think it, it's had a kind of fascinating history. I think it, it traveled, I think it was in the Munn collection at some point, but eventually was donated to the provincial collection at the rooms where it never really saw the light of day because, you know, within the provincial collection, it does, it's not really representative of the wildlife here. Mireille unearthed it and brought it to life in this exhibition. And in response to the story, I created a nest around the base of the bird. And this is made with drawings and prints and photographs and collaged. And then I also wrote a lullaby for the flamingo. At the opening reception of the of the uh, the show, the group show, we all everyone was invited to gather around the bird, and we formed a circle around the bird. And I sang the lullaby to the flamingo. But then uh, everyone was given a card with the lyrics, and this was a keepsake that they were invited to take home. But so they had the lyrics in hand, and then we all sang together, and it was this awkward, bumpy, tentative song that we sang to the flamingo. And it, it really represented, I think, our collective discomfort with that story. And it was, you know, in one, one way, it was sort of an apology and also a love letter at the same time. But of course, um, yeah, it was just a moment to sort of honor, honor that bird and its story. The next project I'll share. It, it, it sort of, it, everything kind of connects and one project grows out of the next. So this project is called The Memorialist. And this was a project that spanned quite a few years. It began in 2013. I began researching it. And now it, it's honestly, it's still ongoing. I keep learning more and uh, it, it's evolving still. So to get to the point, I'll, I'll speak about it quickly to get aware of the time. Uh, so this, this project is about early zoological gardens that opened in the city, the settler city of Halifax in the year 1847. I was researching in the provincial archives for a, a separate performance project that I was doing. And I learned that literally down the street from where I grew up, had had once existed uh, 100 acres of zoological gardens considered to be the first zoological gardens in North America since the Aztec Empire. So it's quite, I was really startled to learn this. When I speak about that, that sort of, that faulty connection with the animal um, in the, the Natural History Museum diorama, um, the zoo also has a similar kind of, I have a similar experience at, at the zoo. I find zoos are, yeah, I've, I've have a hard time visiting zoos. I'm not comfortable with the zoological gardens. I, in a way, I mean, the animal, even though it's filled with, with, with wildlife, in a way, the animal is completely absent. It's been replaced with a spectacle, uh, retold through didactic panels and, in some ways, you know, the, the animal is just, yeah, completely absent from the space. And there is a site, zoological gardens are kind of a fascinating site of, you know, of tension between caring for nature and caring for other animals and harming at the same time. And I think when I learned that a zoo opened down the streets from where I grew up, I, it, it stuck with me. So I researched as much as I could about it. And so this is an early photograph of the zoo taken in the year 1865. The founder of the zoo's name was Andrew Downs. You can see him perched on the bridge in the foreground. And the, the structure in behind him is called the Glass House. This was an aviary, a natural history museum as well. Um, and so Andrew Downs was kind of a fascinating character. He was, he really was the main caretaker of the animals on the grounds. Uh, and he's described as a, almost a sort of father figure to them. He was incredibly in tune to their needs and he traveled through the space. Like, he dedicated every day of his life for the most part. I, he must have had people helping him, but the way that he is described in the text from the era is as an incredibly gentle man in tune, in sync with the natural world. Um, so he was a... a a settler and originally a plumber by trade actually. And he was actually a self-taught naturalist and 
not enough time to get into his full story, but I want to draw your attention to, you know, a contradiction in this story because he was also a sportsman and a master taxidermist. And so this is an image of, um, ptarmigans that was taken on the zoo and you can see the natural landscape where they're situated and in this image you can see andrew downs sitting among the ptarmigans and you can see you know here he is at one with those animals at one with this space and deeply connected to them in this photograph but of course the photograph has been staged and the animals are dead and he's stuffed them and uh there those are those are in, those are birds that he is likely hunted and prepared and mount, like kind of mounted himself. So I think this image really gets to this again that sort of delusion that he had, uh, and this sort of delusion and in, in it you know of, of yeah kind of fathering or nurturing nature but harming it at the same time. He was. So the zoo was quite famous and he also was known, He's he procured specimens from major institutions all over the Western world, according to written accounts of the day. And the zoo was opened between the years 1847 and 1868. It was filled with animals from all over the world, monkeys, polar bears, exotic birds, but predominantly regional animals. And actually Andrew Downs would um, actually catch animals, take animals from the wild bring them to his zoological gardens situated in, in a natural setting in the forest and then build habitat for them within their natural habitat. It is a strange contradiction. A lot of, there's that tension between care and harm again in this space. I wanted to pull out that tension and to also um, tell the story of this zoo and tell the story of Andrew Downs, but also to kind of consider it as a, a really as a symbol of a, a deeper, like, you know, a, a disconnect between those earlier settlers and the natural world. And to do this, I decided that I would follow Andrew Downs's footsteps and retrace them and kind of step into his shoes as best as I could to try to understand him better. I developed a persona for myself and turned it into a sort of performance and documented every step of my research um, using photography uh, and making works along the way. So the first one of, so yeah, there's different branches to this work. One branch is I, I tried to track the specimens that he procured in, in Nova Scotia and sent abroad to try to, to find them and, and to visit them, to see them, to, to make sure that this is true. Like, are they still in existence? I honestly wasn't able to find many specimens, but I did find um, three bird specimens this is a ptarmigan at the Museum of Natural History in New York City in their ornithology collection. And this bird, of course, is no longer able to fly. And so I flew to the bird and I laid a memorial wreath beside it. And now this, this moment kind of lives on in this photograph. This is a spruce grouse at the Smithsonian's uh, ornithology collection. And so the same gesture occurred. And there was another image that I don't have included of a boreal chickadee also in the American Museum of Natural History's collection. I tried to find other examples of specimens that Downs had sent to institutions in the UK in particular, because he was a, a corresponding member of the Zoological Society of London. So I was able to confirm that in the archives there. But I really wasn't able to find any specimens in, in Europe um, or, you know, during kind of researching in the UK. But what I encountered were numerous displaced, of course, displaced wildlife and wildlife, um, you know, from, from this continent um, displaced overseas. And so in my persona's costume, that of a sort of museum docent or scholar, I, and I, you can see I have uh, the memorialist in uh, embroidered onto my blazer and I have a gilded iPad with me. I stocked my iPad uh, with imagery that I had taken in natural settings that I visit in my leisure time. So camping and hiking. And there's something so off about that to me that these animals are no longer able to be in those spaces. They were taken from those spaces, but now I can still walk freely in them. And I showed the animals in the museum specific examples, um, of imagery of their original home. And so these, this now lives on as a, a series of photographs. 
The work has all culminated. There are other parts of this project. There are videos of performances. Uh, there are drawings. There are there's a lot of different chapters, and it presents itself as an exhibition. This is a 2019 installation at the Dalhousie University Art Gallery. Um, so the the image that you see, you can see the video screen here. There's a video still of that of that uh, video. And on the left hand side, you can see a case of birds. And there's actually a whole series of bird cases in the Acadia Wildlife Museum that have been attributed to Andrew Downs that I, I learned about uh, later in the project. And so I created this work in which they have the photographs of the, the bird cases kind of flashing through like a slideshow. And then this image, which is uh, called Crooked Creek Lookoff in New Brunswick, and looking over the forest, their original home. And you can hear there's an, a soundtrack of, of birds in the space. This is another case attributed to Andrew Downs that has since kind of originally making this work, uh, this creating this project. Uh, so I first presented this project in 2016 and, and then later um, learned that this case was at the Nova Scotia Museum and they loaned it to us at the Dalhousie Art Gallery uh, to present. And so I created a sort of a memorial um, yeah, garland to hang above the case. So video stills, I don't have time to get into all of it, but I want to finish with, with this. And this is a diorama in which I have tried to recreate the zoological gardens and, and uh, yeah, really kind of render them in a way. I mean, it reads like a Victorian pop-up book. Uh, that's, that's the goal. So you sort of walk by the space, you can lose yourself in it and you can peer into it and it feels whimsical and, and sort of otherworldly, but it's actually based on a lot of research and, and facts. Like it's, it, the, the enclosures that you encounter and the enclosures are made with color, color pencil drawings. They're actually based on designs that he would have been inspired by at other zoological gardens from the era or from written accounts or from touring the original grounds of the zoo, which remarkably are still undeveloped in the city of Halifax. The original five acres, are, which are very close to the Armdale Rotary and in, in the community of Armdale for anyone who's familiar with the city, uh, it's now an old growth forest that has overtaken the ruins of the zoo. So. This is very much based on, on fact. Uh, however, it does read like fantasy and there's a, a tension there because it's the same sort of fantasy that, and delusion that I kind of am drawn to in this story. Um, so as you walk through it, I should mention too, these are copper plate etchings and they're hand colored and hand cut and then colored pencil drawings. All right, so one more project to share. Uh, and this is, I'm sorry, this is not a great quality photo. It's just an old cell phone photo. Uh, but this is from a photograph taken inside the Thomas McCullough Museum at Dalhousie University. And he was a, so Thomas McCullough was a, a naturalist. Again, we're in Nova Scotia. He was actually a contemporary of, of Andrew Downs. There's, I read a little bit of rivalry between them. They're sort of competing for same funds to start their museums. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. So the Thomas McCullough Museum opened in, this is in the Life Sciences Building at Dalhousie University. It's a, it's a series of actually quite remarkable ornithology specimens. Um, these are, are um, cases designed by Thomas McCullough and his son, Thomas McCullough Jr. The two men were trying to create a provincial museum, essentially a provincial collection to represent Nova Scotia's wildlife. Uh, and what's kind of interesting is Andrew Downs was doing the same thing in a way. He was working with a living museum and these men were working in this more traditional way and they were mounting the birds and sort of st stuffing them and presenting them in these cases. The, yeah, so just, to, I'll tell you a little bit about Thomas McCullough. Uh, he, so he was based out of Picto and is actually the founder of the Picto Academy. And he and actually, he and his sons, he had uh, several sons, they would enter into the backcountry and, and collect as much as they could. They would be hunting for days and then come back and prepare the taxidermy in, at their home on the grounds in Picto. And I, they did create a really remarkable collection, but they ended up selling it, I believe, to a buyer in Scotland uh, to, in order to fund the Picto Academy uh, 
sort of kind of they were in a sort of financial situation and then they started again <laughs> and but, but this is yeah i mean the, the the collection is pretty remarkable they there's you know in the archives you can read about um john audubon visiting these these men and chatting with them about their collection and and kind of you know he's very complimentary of it he's i actually read a letter that he wrote to the mccullough's asking them to help him to secure a variety of birds including a great auk a labrador duck um, and others that were endangered at that time or thought to maybe be extinct this collection Oh, by the way, these are northern curlews, which are thought to be extinct and that are in they're in the collection um, in the life sciences building. And you can see like in, in this old case with the glass, uh, sorry, the cracks in the back. So this collection, I'm really I'm drawn to this narrative. Um, I'll go back to this image. I'm drawn to this narrative because it, I mean, here again is that effort to preserve nature, but it's sort of a a failed a failed effort, a failed gesture. The museum collection they wanted to create, this sort of provincial collection, it, it really, it, it was never achieved. So Thomas McCullough Sr. died before it could be realized. His son, Thomas McCullough Jr. took up the collection. I kind of continued to expand on it and kind of working in secret. And, but it, it, he died before it could be realized. And so very, not a lot of people kind of knew that this was happening or that this existed. And it was donated, it was to Dalhousie University after Thomas McCullough Jr.'s death, where it remained just also kind of hidden and buried until the 1960s when researchers and staff kind of uncovered it. And what they found inside the collection was a Labrador duck specimen, one of the rarest specimens of birds in the world, because uh, it's extinct as we know. And so the Labrador duck is pictured here in this mount, and that's the, the taller, the bird that's standing, the male. And that is not a Labrador duck. The female is a black duck, but it's, the beak has been painted to kind of mimic um, a female Labrador duck. So I was invited to create a response to this space and I, I by independent curator, Lisa Borley and, and in, in partnership with Eye Level Gallery or Eye Level in Halifax, which is an artist run center. And it was a, a three, kind of a three person show. So uh, I was exhibiting with Amy Malbuff, an artist I really admire. And um, Lisa Borley was the curator, but also had a text interventions in the space and then myself. And for my contribution, I wanted to respond directly to this collection. Uh, I visited the Labrador duck specimen. So the Labrador duck was removed from the collection. When, when researchers found it, they thought it's a very valuable specimen. So they sent it to the Canadian Museum of Nature for safekeeping and it's still there. So I visited the bird and I documented it and I created another sort of memorial bouquet to lay beside it. And I wanted to reinsert this back into the museum. And so I reunited the bird with the collection by creating this sort of light box. Also in this, so this is yeah, installation shots from last winter. I also learned of an x-ray of the bird and the staff at the Canadian Museum of Nature really kind and, and scanned the x-ray and got me an image of it. And so I presented the x-ray as well, because again, talking about that that sort of illusion of taxidermy, the illusion is broken here as well. And you can see the pins kind of holding the body together and the glass eyes. Uh, there's no kind of, you know, illusion here. And I, I inserted sort of textile interventions into the space, thinking of the animals as these sort of textiles in a way with skin folded and feathers tucked under and pinned and sewn. And so what you see here is a sort of a funerary wreath that I created for this goose. And I've just imagined has been hanging there for years and must be exhausted. And so I just hung this, um, yeah, this sort of funerary wreath around the bird. Uh, and it's just made with quilting cotton that I had used for a previous project. And uh, so it was actually laser cut at the makerspace in Grenfell campus. But the team there is very, very helpful and, and then sewn together. 
I also created this intervention for the case holding the northern curlews as well. And so this is sort of, again, this sort of drawing and memorial bouquet to kind of wrap around and sort of protect the case. And then I created this hooked rug intervention, which I lay in the space. And this is sort of, it's, it's kind of like a letter to Thomas McCullough Sr. and Thomas McCullough Jr., a letter and a question. Uh, the, what you see in, in the space, all of the uh, natural elements, the ferns and the reeds, these are all elements that I saw in their cases. And I would actually take the natural materials out of the landscape and then dry them until they are totally desaturated. And then they would paint them and reinsert them in the cases. So interesting to see. So in this, in this space, I, yeah, I think I, I wanted to respond to the failure of this museum in a way it was never fully realized. And even now it's so strangely situated in the life sciences building in this brutalist building and, and um, but it, it continues to inform. And a lot of these collections continue to inform and there's this ongoing colonial understanding of nature from these, these spaces. So it's something I'm continuing to explore. This work was completed. It was opened right before COVID shut everything down. It was open for a week and then uh, the museum was shut down. And all of my pieces kind of lived among the lifeless animals for uh, several months until it was safe to get in and, and ship them over, ship them back to me. So I think, I think that's about it, but I really, I just wanted to share these specific works and ongoing now kind of next steps. I'm continuing to work in this way and I really, I do have one more slide to share. And this, uh, you can see the image of the Labrador duck in the very top of this storage cabinet. And that is its home in the Canadian Museum of Nature. And this is a cabinet filled with extinct wildlife. And there's, as soon as an animal is extinct, it is given a pink tag instead of a blue tag. And there's this whole other kind of value system placed on it. And I'm really fascinated by this and this, the kind of life of these animals within the collection is something that I'm continuing to explore in new work. Uh, so thanks everyone. I'm, I'll, I can't see the chat line or anything. So I'm just going to exit the presentation so that I can connect and hopefully I'm not too over time. <laughs> uh, so here thanks. we go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Darcy. This is um, it's really, really fascinating work. Um, and, you know, my 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 own work is in environmental studies and we, we ask similar questions mm -hmm. when it comes to sort of human and nature interactions and that sort of thing. So I, I just found this really, really fascinating. Um, yeah, we've put a notice uh, on the WebEx and also on Facebook for folks to post questions uh, if you have them. And please feel, you know, don't feel like you have to wait for a break in the conversation to post a question or something. Just put totally. them there and we'll we'll tackle them as we go. Um, so maybe I'll ask a question first. If yeah, you totally. Darcy, um, I wrote down a lot of them because I think this is so interesting. I'm going to start with the one that's kind of the most general, um, but I've been curious about it since the beginning. And I think I have a good idea after hearing your whole talk, but what does it mean to be an interdisciplinary artist. Oh, thank you for saying that. I actually meant to explain that at the beginning. <laughs> so as an interdisciplinary artist, I work across different media. So I, I work in painting and drawing, performance art, video, installation, textiles. So you saw all the different projects that I that I shared with you today, but they're they're yeah, they're you they're not sort of one discipline, like only painting or only printmaking. It's really, and so the way that I choose what materials to work with is I actually um, work with, I have an idea for a work and then every, every medium has its own language and its own, a different way to reach an audience or to communicate. And so it's a matter of choosing the best fit for, for the idea. So yeah, really good question. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, there's a couple of people on the WebEx meeting who would like to ask their awesome. questions verbally. Hey. <laughs> so I'm going to recognize Melissa first. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi, Darcy. Hi, Melissa. Hey. Thank, nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just loved this. I really did. 
Um, I want to go back to the flamingo. <laughs> um, and I just actually, before I pose my question, did I hear you correctly? Like that was in Newfoundland. Yeah. It okay. Flew, flew over the province and yes, correct. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess like, you know, your work, there's such a, I think it would be appropriate to call it like, there's a reverence to your work. Right. And then this flamingo struck me as like really absurd, <laughs> I guess, like this whole situation. Um, yeah, and also yeah. that it's a bit of an outlier in a way that it's already removed from sort of its natural place and then removed again in this sort of taxidermied state. And I guess I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about how you interacted with that in, in creating your piece. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it, I think that it is, it is an absurd story. Like it's sort of, that impulse to shoot the bird down is absurd to me. I don't understand it. It's, it's heartbreaking. And then the fact that the, the bird never saw the light of day again, just kind of tucked in this collection. Like then it, it's just sort of failed, like, like a waste at the same time. Like it's just, I don't know, it's just the whole story is absurd and really, hard. And I also, and I, again, I have to credit Mireille Egan for uncovering the story, but it, like it's resonated with a lot of people and myself included, but it, I think, I think that those lullabies, the lullaby that I wrote for it is also kind of absurd. And so it is, like it's, it is a reverence there, but it, you know, the, the bird can't sleep. The bird is dead. The bird wouldn't understand <laughs> the words anyway. Um, but there was a real, the experience of singing that with everybody there, it felt very sincere. Like it felt like a sincere communal gesture of care for that bird. And there's still, it's still a fiction. The bird is dead. The bird is not there anymore, but it's, there was an awkwardness to it. You can imagine it, it's, it's always kind of uncomfortable when someone asks you to sing. <laughs> and you know, it's like, there's that, everyone was out of their comfort zone, but it sounded awkward. It was bumpy. Everyone did a good job. I don't, so if anyone's listening, it was there for that. You did great, but no, but it, it really is, yeah, that, that awkwardness and discomfort, definitely the lullabies feel like a good way for me to engage with it because the, the lyrics are also a little delusional. Like the, I know you couldn't see the lyrics for the other songs, but they're asking, you know, take one last drink from the stream, lay your head and start to dream. I mean, they, it's kind, but cruel at the same time because they're not able to do it. So did I answer your question? I kind of went off. I kind of just dove in. Melissa. <laughs> it was great. Yes. No, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It was a really good, good question. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and I think uh, Shoshana has the next question. Hi, Shoshana. <laughs> Hi, Darcy. So uh, nice to see you. And this was just wonderful. I had no idea about this side of your work and it actually intersects with so many things that I'm so interested in. Okay. And I really share your discomfort around um, zoos and around these and around taxidermy. Mm -hmm. But I've also noticed the kids always love them and always want to go to them. And that I find that off putting the like, let's go to the zoo. Let's go see these exhibits. And even in Newfoundland, even the little communities all have these little museums that have all these taxidermy animals, including a polar bear and things that definitely should not be, have been taxidermed even recently. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you, if you're extending your research at all, like it seems like it's a lot of it's sort of Halifax based and looking at sort of that history and partly because that's your connection in terms of where you, where you come from, if you're finding or developing any interest in like I'm thinking especially of the park and like the museums mm -hmm. in the park that are supposed to be preserving nature um, and you've brought this up but then actually you go in and you see all of these dead animals and um, it doesn't really seem like a site of environmental preservation but more sort of a memorial to death as I think you've been saying mm -hmm. and then a little bit more of a question which is um <laughs> i loved all the flowers um and that is part of the memorial and i was wondering how you made your selections for those and if they're indigenous to like um if there's 
connections to the animals that you're looking at and if they're um you know there's extinct flowers and things too and i wondered yeah so oh such good questions this is and thank you they're so thought such thoughtful questions and yeah and um, so flowers are fresh in my mind right now so i'll jump in with that one first and then move back the so the flowers definitely are chosen thinking about the habitats of the animals that they're adorning um except for, well the 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 flowers across around the Canadian goose, those are based, they were actually wild roses. And so a series of wild roses, which is not, you know, specifically linked to their um, habitat, but is more linked to like roses, I think of ornamentation and, and I have a sort of a, a connection to the wild rose, but then also with that project, sort of cutting cutting them with the laser cutter and, and getting sort of the templates. There's, there's just only a certain amount of detail you can do. Some, some flowers work better than others. And so there's different kind of aesthetic decisions that went into that, but the, the specific bouquets for, um, for like the Labrador duck, for uh, the willow ptarmigan, those are really based on the, those species original habitat and was trying to draw from, from that, that, so that definitely there's, there's that, yeah, they're carefully chosen. And in terms of, and you're right, a lot of these projects, it's so, it's so interesting. Like, yeah, one, one project always leads into another. And so the project with the memorialist, I thought that was, you know, wrapped up, bow finished in 2016 when I exhibited it and I was ready to you know, jump into something else, but it keeps, I keep learning more about the zoo. They've uncovered a whole series of letters from Andrew Downs in their archives, which I learned about, um, it's fairly recent, like 2019, they just been buried or like it's in a, you know, there's so much material and it's, you know, ongoing to kind of work through it. And they've also discovered more photographs of the zoo. So, and I, so I didn't share them in my slide, but, and my, my diagram is actually, I'm pretty on point, which is interesting for me. Like there's a few images like, oh, okay. But so, but it keeps coming up. And I also have like through this project, it's been presented a few times. I've, there's public interest in it in Halifax. Oh my gosh, my battery's going to die. <laughs> plug that in. Sorry. I totally forgot to plug it in. There we go. Uh, so there's, um, I've been invited to do radio interviews and programs in Halifax and talk about it. And so what I find now is I, I get periodically, I get letters from members of the community. They're asking me questions about the zoo. And so I feel like I'm still playing this persona of this historian. I'm not a historian. I'm an artist. I, you know, I, there are, I'm sure flaws to my, my way of researching and what I choose to share. And I, I'm sure there are, but uh, but it's just kind of fascinating to have, I have this other side of my life that is ongoing. So the project continued to expand. I think it's at a place now where, you know, it's, it's over here and it, it, it's still there, but I, I'm really interested in like projects are expanding and actually the, the Thomas McCullough Museum and their connection to uh, Audubon. I've started reading Audubon's diaries from his trip through Labrador. And so he has daily accounts of, of traveling through Labrador on in search of the Labrador duck and in search of a great auk, which he was not able to find. And so that I know is going to lead to something. Um, so I've been reading through that. And um, yeah, I think this like place is so important like where where you're situated always like I like as an as an artist it always impacts the work I make and there are projects that I've created here that are separate from this branch of work so I have a, a project called number one fan that really is inspired by sort of ecotourism and um yeah the, looking at the landscape itself as a spectacle and so there's a sort of a performance project that's been filmed. I've been shooting it mostly in this region in Western Newfoundland. And when I, yeah, continuing to look at the, the yeah, this province will continue to inspire and it's already started. So really great question. And it was awesome to work with the, the rooms um, with that. It was such a, it was one piece and part of a larger body of work, but it's still, I still think about it a lot. So uh, yeah. Every, you never know when 
branches are going to kind of intersect and how one will roll into the next. And COVID was weird. It like kind of stalled a lot of work, but it's starting to come back. And yeah, long-winded answer to your question. It was super decadent to be asked about that and to dive in. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And I love the diorama too, like the Victorian <laughs> element to it. Just loved it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Nice to see you. It's so nice seeing everyone. I love these. I love these talks. <laughs> I think Pamela has our next question. If I think she's Yay, still here. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, hey. Pamela. <laughs> I wonder if she did she. Oh, there you are. So your camera's <laughs> on, but we can't hear you yet, Pamela. Hi, Pam. Hey. Hi there. My son is studying next door. Or he's online and uh, my Wi-Fi. Anyway, you don't need totally to understand. I, I thought I was going to be all brilliant and ask you a question about Audubon, and then you referenced him in your talk, and I was like, darn it. <laughs> she beat me to it. I grew up on Audubon. My dad is a huge bird watcher, fan of birds. Uh, we have the entire Audubon collection in our house, the old one from like the 1970s or 60s oh, wow. or whatever it was. And anyway, um, these days, of course, the Audubon Society is completely preservationist, and I think they would keel over and die before they would ever perform taxidermy on a bird, um, because they're all about living and preserving mm -hmm. and, you know, donate now to save this particular species and that sort of thing. So when you said um, that he was complimentary of the exhibit that he had seen, I was a little bit bowled over because the Audubon Society I know today would never have complimented it. They would have um, condemned it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but now the society goes back to the 1800s. And of course, the um, principles we hold near and dear today, they it wouldn't have occurred to them that, you know, okay, mm -hmm. who cares if we stuff a bird? You know, there's lots of birds. But I'm just wondering, did you have that reaction to that letter that he was complimentary of, of these stuffed birds no can you get me one kind of thing or uh, yeah does it strike you as bizarre that he would have had that kind of reaction absolutely I think and I so Audubon was collecting the birds to then draw and study as wildlife artists did from that era you would you know hunt the animal and then it, it then it would sit still for you <laughs> like it, I it's kind of horrific, but then there again, I'm, I'm fascinated by these stories in my work as I, I'm, I find them kind of awful, but they also inform an ongoing understanding of, of nature. So the, yeah, this desire, again, the desire to recreate the animal in those imagery it, and Audubon's work is so beautiful and really quite important what he was able to achieve. But yeah, there's a brutality to it, and, and so basically, it, it, in the in the sorry to interrupt you, but no, in no. the um, journey to document them as a sort of visual art scientific uh, procedure, say process, he would have had to kill all those birds in order mm -hmm. to draw them, is what you're telling me. Yeah, like all those yeah. birds in my Audubon books that I went, oh, nice birdie when I was little, they were all dead in order for him to do that right yeah isn't that yeah, it's okay. so uh, hard, it's, it's so brutal, sad right? isn't it yeah. it's so brutal and it's it's that i mean there it is that colonial understanding of nature to take it you know yeah take it and and then i i'm i'm interested in that to take it to preserve it or to uh, how they, it, there's it's like there's a good in preserving i guess but but then to take it is so wrong. Like to, so, and I, I, I think I was surprised reading, what surprised me was reading this letter. So Audubon visited the McCulloughs in Picto and um, was, was impressed with their work and they have correspondence. I believe the original letters are, is it in, I can't remember what archives they're in. Is it in Yale's archives maybe? Ooh, this is being recorded. I don't know. I don't know the exact spot. Uh, but you can read copies of them at the, the Thomas McCullough archives in Picto. And he literally has a list of all the birds that he's looking for in the region that he's having a hard time finding. And I was surprised that someone who's tracking the disappearance of these species would then ask to have a, 
a Labrador duck sent his way. If you find one, you know, it's just that, that was, I, I was surprised by that, but I shouldn't have been, I guess it's sort of, it's, it, this was the mentality with that, you know, this sort of settler mentality of that time. So yeah, there's, there's something, there is sort of a weight to it, isn't there? But I think it's definitely worth, you know, reading back through these stories and picking them apart and seeing these tensions and these problems. I, I see merit in that and, and processing them because it's emotional to, you know, look at, I think you provided a beautiful example of, you know, this, the connection you felt as a child to these images. And then it's, it's sort of, it's a disappointment to, to hear that it's, it's hard. It's, it is emotional. And I think, um, that piece tuck in the Nova Scotia museum and finishing that piece and seeing, you know, people in the audience were weeping afterwards. And it's, it's, you know, the illusion broke for them too. Like there is this sort of, yeah, but it, it's also is important for that to happen, to understand the flaws in this way we've thought within a settler culture kind of interpreted the natural world. So thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Great question. <laughs> uh, there aren't any other questions on the Facebook stream or in WebEx, but maybe I'll ask the last one. Yeah, um, sure. That's all right with this you. Is fun. Uh, Thank you for so, this question. <laughs> yeah, I'm finding this discussion really, really fascinating as well. Um, and my question is, uh, let me preface this with, I know that most of the time uh, art, artistic works are not meant to be uh, normative they're not meant to say okay i did this and what i'm saying is you should do things this way you know people who are are seeing this art they're they're more about self-interpretation and and reflection um but i i do want to ask more of a normative question after all of this which is yeah. um you know based on what we know in this understanding you know is it possible for humans to genuinely engage in with wildlife in a way that isn't sort of hypocritical or you know fundamentally unethical because most of the ways we tend to engage you're right you know i think our psychology lends itself to you know it's very difficult for people to appreciate an animal without being able to see it or touch it um you know in, in a zoo or in taxidermy and that sort of thing and encounters in the wild are not as close um you know they don't they don't lend themselves as well to that sort of psychological appreciation so you know what what is the I know this is normative, but what is the right way to engage or appreciate wildlife? <laughs> it's a good question. And I think, and I think that absolutely some people are, are very much able to do this in some cultures, but, and of course my work is about my culture, which is a settler culture and a Western culture. And I think that, I think that there have been, you know, myths in this culture, some of which I, you know, presented today in a way in this. And, and so I think that part of having that constructive relationship is recognizing, you know, the myths of the past, but also I think, I think it's, it's actually quite easy to be very respectful of the natural world and, and respect, you know, respect our place within it, how in, you know, how impacted we are, how much we need nature, <laughs> uh, like how we are a part of it. We are animals. Um, you know, I, we're, I'm a mammal. <laughs> like we are deeply connected and it's, but to disrupt the hierarchy as well. And so, you know, I think that a lot of these colonial interpretations of nature place humans at the top. And that's, that's a problem. I think that's, um, so a more constructive, cohesive, respectful interaction. And I, I, yeah, I, I'm certainly hopeful that it can be that way. And many people are already there, but, but there's, there's still, yeah, there's still work to do, but that's part of the fun about being an artist too, is you can poke at this and I maybe don't have a direct answer, but it's nice to be able to kind of stir a little bit and highlight you know, these moments and without the, the pressure of kind of delivering a direct, you know, this is what we need to do, but, um, but then to ask questions and also to use this language of, 
yeah, it's like, I, and I love the links of, I love it when artists and scientists link and connect and because we, there's so many, yeah, like artists, you have this sort of language of the senses, like creating this emotional response or, or this sensorial experience. And I think there's a lot of potential for artists and, and scientists to kind of collaborate and, and yeah, share information, share knowledge and in, in ways to make it accessible and like, yeah, to a, a diverse audience. And anyway, I'm rambling on a little bit, but uh, your question was a good one. Got me going. <laughs> well, this has been great. Uh, thanks so much for this, Darcy. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy that everything seems to have gone well with the stream and it'll be recorded. So um, awesome. yeah, if anybody is watching the recording, uh, you know, thanks, thanks for viewing, even if after the fact. Um, and it will be posted on the Grenfell uh, webpage. So I suppose if you have questions after, you can post them there, but there's no guarantee that, that any <laughs> of us will necessarily find them. Um, but yeah, uh, just a, a thanks on behalf of the FLIRT committee to you, Darcy. Uh, this has been really great. And uh, yeah, we generally have these once a week, everyone. So if you're interested, just look out for those uh, posts on the Grenfell page, or you can add yourself to our mailing list by emailing. Thank you so much so, for inviting me. It was really fun. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for the yeah. question. You're awesome. Great. So um, I don't know if Jen is still connected to end the meeting, but if we all leave the meeting, it'll be quite clear that the recording is over.